two great announcements uh, in my MBBS days really caught my attention, changed my perspective about medicine, and also probably decided my future career. And fortunately, both of them had to do with the Human Genome Program. Now, the Human Genome Program was an international initiative to understand the blueprint of the human genome. Unfortunately, India was not part of the Human Genome Program. And the early years were also the time across the world when genomics was accelerating. And this acceleration was quite evident not just in the number of genomes that one could sequence, but also in, in the cost which has been reducing quite significantly over the years. And this was an opportune moment and in many ways a turning point because India also decided to invest into sequencing genomes. And in December 2009, we were fortunate to have put together the first Indian genome, working with my colleague and collaborator, Dr. Sridhar Shivasupu, and two young graduate students, Ashok and Remya, who could muster the courage to assemble, analyze, and put together a genome from India. Now, of course, that was a point in time, uh, uh, or rather a landmark in my life, because one of the major things that we were thinking of was from one, how can this genome now impact human lives? How can this be used by clinicians across the country and across the world? And it was just incidental that the day after the genome was announced, my colleague Sridhar got a phone call from somebody who identified himself as Bhai. While reluctant to, to speak to Bhai in great detail, the persistent Bhai repeatedly called us, rather pestered us, and stated that we had the solution to his problem. Now, being a clinician and trained as a clinician, we delved deep into what Bhai had, and to a surprise, what we realized was that Bhai had a condition an extremely rare genetic condition called epidermolysis bullosa. Now, epidermolysis bullosa is a condition of the skin where the skin could open up into bubbles as if you had a burn, wherever you had a pressure point or whether, wherever you had an injury. And it was quite painful. And in, and in further interviews with Bhai and visiting his hometown, what we realized is Bhai was not alone. Bhai was just one member of an extended family of a, a few dozen individuals who were also affected with a similar condition. Now, this was just incidental, but Bhai was not alone. And there are around 70 million people in India like Bhai. All of them are affected by one or another genetic disease or a genetic condition. There are around over 3,000 odd genetic diseases now documented in literature. And individually, they are extremely rare. And they go through multiple clinician visits, multiple rounds of misdiagnosis, and lose a considerable amount of time and, of course, resources in their pursuit of a diagnosis. Now, that is really the plight of people with genetic diseases. And of course, Bhai had a genome done with us. We did identify the genetic mutation and we could advise the clinicians on the way forward in terms of management, in terms of prognosis, and of course, more importantly, in terms of helping the family eliminate the disease in the successive generations 
through genetic counseling and prenatal testing. Now, of course, you could think of this as a problem because 70 million people is a huge number which could fit into multiple cities, if not states of the country. But that is also an opportunity in a country like India because we are a very large population of a sixth of the world. Unlike large populations across, we are quite diverse in our genetic ancestry. We are stratified into small populations or endogamous groups that we call essentially people who marry within the same communities. And it is estimated that we have around 4,000 odd endogamous groups. And even more importantly, they still have a very close-knit family structure, unlike the rest of the world, which has been displaced by war or by famine. They still have families intact and preserved for generations. And practically everything in genetics starts with a pedigree. Of course, after thinking for quite a while and working up a number of such cases like that of Pai, in 2015, we put together a program with Sridhar, my close colleague and collaborator. And this program was called the Genomics for Understanding Rare Diseases India Alliance Network. The idea was very simple. We could talk to and work with clinicians who see extremely rare genetic conditions in their clinic. We could access the samples from the patients and families after a standardized consent and process. We could do the best of genomic and analysis that we could build upon and get back to the clinician with a molecular diagnosis. Now, this molecular diagnosis essentially would put an end to the diagnostic ODC for the patient and the family and of course for the clinician and in many ways could direct the clinician to advise patients appropriately on the way forward. But that is really not possible in all cases. A significant large number of cases still do not have a diagnosis despite the best genomics that we do. And that is what we also take back to the experimental setup to understand more about how we can interpret genomes much better. Well, when we started this program in 2015, what caught our eye was this article which appeared in Indian Express, which was a plight of a family who petitioned the president of India to euthanize six of their kids. Now think of the plight of a family who would, who would ask or petition to euthanize their own kids. And that was largely because these kids had a progressive neurological disorder which rendered them in a debilitated state. And they didn't have a diagnosis. They didn't have a treatment and therefore they didn't have hope. Fortunately, we could access this family working closely with non-governmental organizations. We could do the genomic sequence of members of this family. We could identify the genetic mutation in a gene called MLC1. And we could provide a diagnosis for this family as megalencephalic leukoencephalopathy with subcortical cyst type 1. That's really a mouthful of a name. But such names are really uncommon uh, in, in genetics. Now, the interesting part of this genetic mutation was that apart from what we found, there was just another report of this genetic mutation, and that was from the Middle East. So we went back to this family and a close community, and we realized that there are many, many more members of this community who have children affected with this extremely rare genetic disorder. And with Human Welfare Foundation, an NGO which works in the community, we could do a screening of 
multiple members of the community, almost 100 individuals. And what we realized was around additionally four other families had children affected with genetic disease and 28 percent of the members in the community were carriers of this genetic disease. In other words, of the two copies of genomes that we have, one of the copy had this genetic mutation. Now, especially when you add consanguinity in, in, in terms of the marriage practice, which is cultural and practiced across different communities in India, that would necessarily mean that there were thousands of individuals who could benefit from the genetic test. So right from the case referral in 2016 to today, the diagnostic for this genetic condition widely available in the market, we could pull it all together working closely with clinicians. And this family was extensively followed up with Professor Shefali Kulati in the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in Delhi. Now you might think that this is just a one-off phenomenon. It is not really. There are of course genetic diseases which are sporadic in origin. There are genetic diseases which have a clear ancestry in origin. And as I stated before, the other report for the genetic mutation was from the Middle East. And there are many more communities in India who trace their ancestry from different parts of the Middle East. They came as traders as early as during the period of Ashoka. They came as friends. They came as explorers. They came as invaders. But nevertheless, they have all remained Indian all throughout these periods of time. In many ways, they are indistinguishable from other Indians, but only with a small part of the genome which they brought from where they came from. And also diseases, or rather genetic diseases, which are prevalent in those regions where they come from. Now that becomes really important uh, because genomic tools can now understand and extrapolate this information to make better diagnosis and better care for such individuals. Now that really brings up to the question that of course I talked about prevalent genetic diseases. Now how do we really understand prevalence of a genetic disease? And the traditional approach has been to talk to clinicians who see genetic diseases in their clinics and ask this question how frequently or how infrequently do you see genetic diseases? Now, there is a fundamental problem and a bias with such an approach because this is under the assumption that clinicians really know how to diagnose a genetic disease. So, we thought how can we turn this upon itself and ask a very simple question. Can genomes identify diseases which are prevalent in the community? And then therefore, can we teach clinicians what to look for so that they can do a better job at identifying genetic conditions. And that's when we started this program in 2018 called Indigen. And the idea was of Indigen was to sequence a thousand odd genomes of representative large populations from across the country and use it for public health applications. And how do we use it for public health applications? By looking at evidence on genetic diseases or otherwise mutations which can cause genetic diseases and asking the question how prevalent are they in the Indian population or where are these genetic diseases prevalent in India. So we could identify genetic diseases which were otherwise probably missed by clinicians. We could identify genetic conditions which never go to clinicians and therefore enable precise diagnosis and also policy building. And the number of thousand is important in a population like India because practically every individual is representative of a million individuals. Or in other words, diseases which are prevalent in the thousand would mean you could identify treatable genetic conditions, 
We could identify variants which could cause adverse drug reactions, cancer susceptibility, genetic mutations, and diseases which are very specific in certain populations. So in other words, what we really want to create is not just solving one case, but actually an ecosystem uh, across in India, which could accelerate public health genomics, or rather application of genomics for public health. This could involve clinicians and patient education. We run a fellowship program, probably one of the first in the country. We provide genetic diagnosis, uh, cost-effective gen di genetic diagnosis to a number of genetic conditions which are prevalent in the country. We work with the industry to roll out this genetic diagnostics in diagnostic companies. We do extensive research in the area of drug development and also modeling diseases in systems. And of course, getting back to public health in tracing the origin and spread of these diseases so that we can help patients and families much better. But as we accelerate the pace of genomics, it's also important that we need to adapt to the changing world of evidence. And genomics is one area where evidence is emerging ever rapidly. And therefore, the interpretation of genome also has to keep pace with the emerging levels of evidence. So in other words, what we think is genomics can make medicine very predictive, can make diagnosis very precise, treatment very personalized, and in many ways, the genomic insights could prevent genetic diseases from recurring in families. And this is all possible only with the central participatory role, not just of clinicians, not just of researchers, not just of families, but also people around us. Thank you very much.